Today's episode has a slightly different twist. We're going to nerd out on some of the latest bike tech on the market today and talk about how it applies to the athlete's performance. To discuss that and more, we've got a really special guest, and it's Mike Vittorio of Zip Wheels. Mike, can you tell the audience a bit more about yourself? Yeah, I'm a, a design engineer for uh, Zip Speed Weaponry in Indianapolis, uh, focusing on uh, wheel design. All right, and you're the, the engineer and mastermind behind this new 303S disc wheel set, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, but, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it's, it's a big team, uh, not just me, but yeah, I was the design engineer for the, the 303S. Awesome. And, and very humble as well. And that's, that's a good point. I mean, it's, it uh, takes a team to do some pretty, pretty great things, uh, at, at every level like this. So, um, so where, where are you talking to us from today, Mike? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, uh, at home. Uh, here in uh, my new, or should I say, guest bedroom home office uh, in Indianapolis. So I, I live uh, kind of southeast of the city down here, and and uh, been working home for some working at home for some months now. <laughs> yeah, we should should probably uh, timestamp this as June eleventh for the recording, and we're ah, still. Yeah still um, amongst the uh the COVID-19 uh stuff going on so uh thank you for taking time out of your working from home um process to to talk with us yeah it was a long commute thanks <laughs> <laughs> all right so there's more than just wheels to talk about today but we're, we're, so we'll, we'll start high level on all the things and then drill down a deeper into the wheel sets and explore the philosophy of how it's all connected so Word on the street is that there are big changes not only coming, but are they are here from SRAM and ZIP. Uh, can you can you talk about some of those big changes coming out of Indianapolis's or out of Indianapolis and, and why it's happening now? Yeah. Um, you know, I we already, you know, hit upon the 303S wheel set and uh in general the new 303 family. But um you know, at Zip, we had a big launch here, uh, uh, I guess, just about a month ago. And, you know, we revamped our, our Zip logo. Um, we've been uh, increasing our, our tech on the wheels, specifically, um, you know, in terms of uh, the tire whiz component. And, um, you know, we're seeing more versatility in in our wheel use out in the marketplace and we're trying to uh you know adapt our our products to to suit that need um so yeah a lot of changes and a lot of changes in the market and and you know we're we're just keeping up at zip so. i like it i like it. it zip i mean to me it's it's known for and kind of legendary for the advancements in aerodynamics and speed so are, are the changes in the 303 family as well as everything else, are they still focused on those two elements or is there more to the story? Well, uh, you know, I, I think the, the zip motto uh, has kind of become this making you faster. And so making you faster, aerodynamics is certainly a component of that. But, you know, we've kind of discovered in the 303 development that it's not everything. Um, one place I think that, that is pretty cool to point this out just for zip as a company is with the three zero moto product. So that, that product is, it's not arrow, it's a mountain bike wheel, but the technology that was put into that product is to make the rider faster, to make you faster. And, and, uh, that, that comes with, uh, you know, the, the, unique ankle compliance of that single wall product and how it was able to corner. So, you know, there are a lot of things I'm sure we'll get into with the road wheels that it's now it's kind of going beyond aerodynamics, but it's certainly still a, a, a part of the story. Got it. Got it. Okay. So as we're talking about kind of what you at zip call the next chapter in speed it kind of starts with the 303 wheel set and there's there's 
two different wheel sets, right? There's the Firecrest and then the 303S. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. Okay. Those are the, the two brand new wheel sets. Yep. Two brand new wheel sets. What is the, I mean, we'll get into the specifics of each, but what would be the distinguishable distant, or difference between the two? Yeah. So the 303 Firecrest is, uh, um, well, I think most listeners are probably, I should start, are probably familiar with um, the Zip product line. But if they're not, um, kind of the the way we, we have it laid out is the NSW being a kind of halo level uh, uh, products, uh, typically defined by the lightest weight, um, um, usually, uh, you know, the, the the turbical technology that's in our 454 and 858 wheels at the NSW level. And then there's the Firecrest level wheels, which um, uh, bring usually all the same standard features, but um, typically with a, a different um, hub um, and spoke setup traditionally. Um, so the 303 Firecrest comes in at that Firecrest level and is uh, has a depth of 40 millimeters and a new internal width of 25 millimeters. And then the um, 303S, which is positioned um, in the old spot that the 302 disc brake wheel was, has a depth of 45 millimeters and an internal width of uh, now 23 millimeters compared to the old 17 millimeters. So a big change there at the 303S level. So those are kind of the, um, the two spots that those live in the 303 family. Got it. Got it. And for, for those who may not be like the biggest bike tech junkies out there and you're starting to go cross-eyed at some of those numbers that me and Mike are like, Whoa, that's really cool. And that's really (laughs) new. Uh, don't worry. We're going to talk about those and you can also look them up uh, like on the website and, and, and kind of see visually what that looks like in comparison to the previous models. So let's, Let's talk more about those nerdy new things, Mike. Um, What I like is you guys at at Zip call call it the next chapter in speed. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you talk about TSE or the total system efficiency. Could you talk about what you mean by that and why Zip has taken this approach? Yeah, absolutely. So... um... You know, total fish system efficiency is is really this notion that um, it, you need to look at the entire system as a whole in terms of the optimization of performance. So, you know, before you asked, um, you know, aerodynamics and speed, well, it's going beyond aerodynamics as as kind of your singular focus. So what we did is, you know, we looked at, all of the the components that have an influence on speed and then how to optimize those um, for the whole system. Got it. For the whole system as the bike, the rider, like the bike frame, the rider, the wheels, the complete system. Yes, I, I think, you know, for us, we're obviously focused on the wheel itself. So, you know, the, the, these these components or forces are, you know, it narrows down to, to wind resistance, gravity, rolling resistance, vibration losses, and inertial forces. So those are the components and specifically how they interact with the, the tire and wheel system are, are what we have control over. So that's that's where we were focusing in in this kind of mindset of total system efficiency. Got it. So if I'm that type of rider that wants to go anywhere, do anything, but I don't want to sacrifice my performance, I don't want to sacrifice speed, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, the, the, the market is moving towards this kind of all road mentality. So taking, you know, your road bike or your what you would call traditional road bike, on roads that you never would have gone on maybe five, 10 years ago. And then further the, the gravel bikes of the world popping up all over the place and wanting to explore, uh, you know, select single track, um, gravel roads, fire roads, et cetera. So that was all within the scope of the design of the 303 family. 
And the, those are the factors that go into this, this total system efficiency mindset and how, how we designed the wheels for each of those, those, um, uh, each of those situations. Yeah. Got it, man. I, I wish, so I used to live in Colorado for, for 10 years and I do, we do these long rides, uh, as coaches at CTS and, we have these old, you know, like fire roads that connect to paved roads up in kind of like the high country and old mining towns and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we were running 23s on road bikes, you know, because you'd have to climb a bunch, you know, on road to, to get there. You connect in and then all of a sudden you head out to Cripple Creek or Victor and then come all the way down the pass. And I remember being pretty skittish on those <laughs> fire roads with 23s tubed and so a wheel set like this would would be very ideal for a situation like that right yeah oh absolutely oh i'm sure you were getting um really beat up with those 23s i can i can imagine so yeah that's beyond yeah that's absolutely right and that's not to say that um you know i think that's that's a perfect example of transitioning between surfaces i mean that's a lot of what we're talking about and and even you know, I'm here in Indianapolis and even around me, you know, we have a lot of, uh, what we call, you know, the chip and seal road, which is, uh, right. Right. You know, laid loose asphalt that over time, you know, will, will harden. And I mean, that's not gravel, but you turn onto one of those things and, and you're still trying to hammer, right. You're out for a training session and it's, yep. it's no time to get squeamish. So yeah, that, that, that's, that that's exactly these are exactly the situations that we're talking about and i i think it almost everyone can can really relate to those sort of scenarios um you know w- one way or another yeah absolutely absolutely so with the tse or the total system efficiency the four pillars are wind resistance gravity rolling resistance and vibrational losses can you can you explain those just like at a high level, just a little bit more? Like, what are we talking about when we're talking wind resistance and gravity and that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, wind resistance. I think um, in terms of of wheels and and uh, you said before, kind of being techy. That's 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 that aerodynamic drag that um, you know I think a lot of people are really familiar with. Um, so that's kind of covers wind resistance, and there are several components to to aero drag. I, I don't think I'm going to get into to all sure. the detail yep. there, but um, that's really what we're talking about when when we say wind resistance. Um, you know, the next was the the gravity component, and that really comes down to to system weight. And um, as a part of that, I think I'd also like to to loop in the the inertial forces there which is also connected to system weight, right? So there's your, your, um, uh, you know, that's accelerating, decelerating, and it, there's a kind of a tangential component um, along the road, which is just your overall system weight, which is largely driven by, by rider and, um, you know, all your kit, bike, wheels, whatever else you're carrying. And then there's this um, rotational inertia, which is really driven by um, the rim weight. So that's, that's kind of what we focus on there. And really that's just, uh, um, you know, low weight wins in terms of, of gravity. So hauling yourself up a hill and reducing inertial forces. Then there's a rolling resistance. So, um, that's the energy loss, um, that occurs, um, every time your, your tire goes through a complete rotation. Um, so that that's happening on, um, every single road service, every time you're out riding, always. So just to move your bike, you're going to get some rolling resistance loss at, at all speeds, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas, whereas wind resistance, aero drag is, is um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a Only a happens at certain factor, speeds. Right? Well, yep. yeah, yep. so it's, it's gr- grossly increases as you keep yes. going faster. Rolling resistance is, is relatively constant. Yep. And then there's the vibrational losses, and um, those increase as surface roughness of the road decreases. So as as the road gets worse, vibrational losses come bigger and bigger into play. So I, okay. I think I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. I think we've all been on a rough road, and 
and ended up going slower. So uh, <laughs> I, I think that one's, you know, everybody's got a, a pretty good feel for vibration losses. Uh, they do. And I think, I think that rough road, the chattery road, I think that we can all resonate with that. But as we break down each of those components at zip, I, I was able to uh, watch a demonstration of how you guys actually measured vibrational losses. So I, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's pretty unique. So, and how it applies to the athlete's performance in, in particular. So, but let's, let's circle back first to wind resistance and, and almost this concept of wider is better. Now I might be wrong here, but it, as it applies to wind resistance, the, the air is moving around this kind of like wider object, um, to other aspects. And are you claiming that wider is indeed better? Yeah, I, I think I want to be a little bit careful here with, with okay. the wider is better. So um, I, I think part of the total story and, uh, you know, as, as we go into the other, you know, kind of talking about these other components of, of TSE, you know, there are other benefits to, there are a lot of benefits to, to wide tires. So, you know, when we say wider is better, if you've got a wide tire, you it necessitates a wider rim to um, ensure that you still have an, uh, an aerodynamic package. So, um, you know, in, in pure aerodynamics theory, a, a thin plate is actually the, you know, the, the best thing you can have. Um, so you know, wider in terms of pure arrow is not necessarily better, but the total package is, is better. So, um, you know, wider tires have their benefits and to gain those benefits without having a penalty, an arrow penalty, you need a wider rim. So that, that's kind of how that all connects in. Um, you know, that there are sense. some inter interactions with the, with the frame that, that I kind of think you're alluding to. Um, but those are, those are quite difficult to measure and they also, um, you know, it's kind of pretty frame dependent. So that's not necessarily something, you know, we're, we're studying in depth with this development. Got it. Got it. So why are we going And this is a little off tangent here, Mike, but like, why are we going wider now compared to five to 10 years ago? Yeah, that's. That's a great question. So I, I think, you know, we've, I think a lot of it comes from um, some, some new research that, that ourselves and, and then, you know, other people within the bikes industry have been doing in terms of, um, you know, rolling resistance in its, in, in how to reduce it, as well as these vibration losses I touched on. So as we start to gain more knowledge, we start to kind of change our tack a little bit and, and start to realize what's, um, what's the best system, what's that most efficient system to help the rider go fast. So, um, you know, I, I really think it's, it's this new knowledge. And then also, um, as you really briefly touched on, new ways to measure um, that system, right? So if, if you're just in isolated either in a tunnel or on a, a smooth drum that gives you a completely different answer than um, if you're measuring, you know, in the real world or, or on more sophisticated equipment. So I, I think that's really why this is happening now, as well as, you know, we're seeing frame manufacturers start to open up tolerances on frames. And so, yeah. you know, to be quite frank, if, if there's not room for a, a 28 millimeter tire, we can't sell you a rim that, that has a 28 millimeter tire mounted to it. Right. <laughs> right so, right. um, all those things kind of in combination is, is kind of why this is happening now. Okay. So, so if there's a listener here on this podcast and they're saying, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go wider. I'm running, you know, 25s now and I'm going to try 28 or even, uh, say a 30 or 32, yeah, my, my frame can't handle that. I'm just going to put it on the tire that I, or the wheel that I have. Would you advise that or what you said before about it needs the wider, um, 
in that it needs the wider rim in order to achieve that yeah that's a that's a good question i i think it depends on that that rider's um condition so if 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 he's you know he or she is is out um riding primarily um let's say mostly smooth tarmac and they've got a um a rim that has more of a traditional internal width um you know they they might not see some of the performance gains of going wider um, because they're going to be paying a, an an arrow penalty that's going to be difficult to overcome. So um, you know if, if they're looking for mixed surface riding, um, you know, and, and they're going off the tarmac a little bit, then yeah, going for that um, that wider tire may may provide some some benefit. So it, it's really situational. Um, sure. But but to get the 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 true all round benefit. Of, of a of a let's call it a wider than traditional tire you really do need a um a rim that that suits that is designed for it and, then, and so that's the system that you're talking about a wider internal with the wider tire yeah correct yeah yep. yeah got it got it okay okay well let's let's talk let's talk gravity and i like how zip frames up like that term gravity because it's more than just weight but I mean, all the weight weenies out there will appreciate this. The the new 303S and the 303 get a pretty significant weight loss. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we saved uh, about 300 grams per wheel set on the 303 Firecrest um, versus, you know, the old 303 Firecrest. And, um, you know, for the 303S, that savings was about 155 grams from the old uh, 302 disc brake that it replaced. So yeah, really in terms of wheel sets, that's, that's a pretty big leap. Yeah, that's, that's a real big leap for sure. And that, you know, you'll notice that in the long hill climbs, but you, you mentioned, you know, roll, you mentioned, um, you mentioned rotational weight and how that applies to accelerate acceleratory forces and kind of overall performance there. How would a lighter weight wheel make you faster or make you perform better? Yeah. So let's restate the obvious. Like you said, the, you know, if, if you're going out for a, a, a hill climb day, weight, weight starts to be one of the biggest factors you think about. So lighter weight in your wheel set is, is just part of that overall bike system and human weight that, that you, you always want to be reducing in terms of, of climbing up a mountain. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, in terms of, of inertial forces, you know, a lighter weight wheel set, like I said, in, in terms of the tangential forces is going to um, aid in the reduction of the acceleration force needed to get up to speed, mm -hmm. as well as that um, snappy feel of, of that's really comes from the inertial force. And that comes from the whim, rim weight. So that's that's the force required to, to get your wheel spinning up to speed, right? So uh, I, I think most riders, when they put on a lighter weight wheel set, that's one of the first things they notice is when they're accelerating is that kind of that whether the wheel set feels snappy. Um, you know, I know that's not a very technical term, but that, that kind of is the most emotional term I can think of for it. Oh yeah, that um, resonates for sure. So these these things are for climbers as well as crit racers. Sure, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yep, and 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 you know, I, I would be remiss if I said that um, a reduction in in rim weight inertial forces also helps with braking to some extent, right? So right. I know we we're, we're switching to disc brakes, um, or these are disc. I should say these are disc brake wheel sets. So. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people start once you once you get that hear that disc brake, you start to turn off. Oh, braking now it doesn't matter um, because you know I don't get the same hand fatigue. We've made advancements, but but it does. I mean, you know that reduction in weight it, it is going to help you stop faster um, e even in a disc brake wheel set. So being lightweight has a lot of advantages for sure. Yeah, and I'm just I mean you know, I made the analogy of hill climber, crit racer, but I mean, riding Fondos, going to the coffee shop, uh, trying to out sprint your, your friend on the group, ride. I mean, it's, 
all of those aspects filter into, hey, this is going to be way more fun <laughs> when I ride yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So one one concern perhaps is, you know, when we're scraping off carbon or weight decreases, uh, sometimes we think that the durability or the integrity can be compromised. Is that true in this situation? Uh, no, not... <laughs> Not in this situation, to be blunt. Um, okay. You know the both the three hundred three Firecrest and three hundred three S are are actually they're they're more durable, um, stronger than than the previous generation wheel they replaced. So that that was something that for us was was important as we're um, looking at the total system. We're asking these wheel sets to do more than they ever had before. So we wanted them to be stronger. You know we. We achieve that in a couple of different ways. Um, I don't think it, I, I've mentioned it yet, but both of these wheel sets are, are hookless. So um, for those not what is that? What does that mean? Yeah. What does that yeah, mean? Yeah. So for those not familiar, so a, a traditional um, carbon road rim um, has a, a, what they call a crochet hook um, that aids in, in locking in the bead in, in the rim. So when you, you mount your tire, um, the, the tire bead sits underneath that um, crocheted hook. Um, and these rims do without that, that hook, um, which, um, you know, is, is only able to be done because of advancements in um, tubeless tire technology. So um, that means really it's the tire beads themselves have become uh, stiffer and stronger so that now you don't need that hook to retain the tire um, on the rim anymore. Um, you know, one, one thing we like to bring up is, is in, in motorcycle rims and uh, in, in, in car uh, rims, they're all hookless. And, and so that, this technology of being hookless, is, it's been out in, in, in that realm for a very long time. And in the last 10, 15 years, it's been on mountain bikes for, for a long time. So we're really, you know, we're bringing that technology into, uh, into road cycling. And it has its benefits. And one of those is, is that it's more efficient in transferring impact forces into um, the sidewall of the rim and then ultimately into the, the, the I, I, ID or the, the um, inner diameter and, and then into the hub. So, um, you know, hookless has, has a lot of advantages in that, in that case. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, I've been, I've been running hookless uh, wheels on my mountain bike now for about two or three years when NB first came out uh, with those. And I, I noticed that immediately, just a very, very good riding experience from there. Um, but so the hookless, basically, if you could look at the rim, the internal rim profile, it looks like a U, right? As opposed to a U with a little, little, little hook on there. <laughs> That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and a very quick, um, you know, either it's, a, um, you know, our, our website or our materials for cross sections, but there, are, there are a lot of examples pretty easily accessible online to kind of get a good good picture. So pretty quick Google search gets you, gets you some good, some great examples. Cool. Cool. So when, when people are airing these things up, are they still going to hear that ping, ping, ping? And then the, like the snapping of the tubeless tire setting in, or is that done away with? Yeah, they'll, they'll still, they'll still hear that. So that, okay. that, that ping that you're referring to is, is the bead moving from the, um, center or the what we call the well of the rim up onto the bead seats so it's actually snapping up onto the bead seats so the the tire bead is actually a smaller diameter than the bead seat and that's intentional so that the the um, tire bead has to stretch up onto that um, that surface that horizontal surface inside or on on the rim so that pinging is is the the bead finally popping onto that surface, um, and you'll still hear that. That actually isn't isn't um, influenced whether there's a hook or not. Got it. Got it. Okay. So these things are lighter and stronger than any other previous versions of zip wheels. 
that have existed? Um, I I think the the best way to say it is that they're they're lighter and stronger than their predecessors. I I can't uh, I can't speak for the the entire history of zip wheels. <laughs> I don't think I'm <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I'm uh, cleared for so that's that broad of a statement, but. For okay, sure, uh, not know, on the record then, not on the record. <laughs> sure, sure. But they're definitely stronger than their their previous their previous generation um that they replaced. And I think we you actually brought up something interesting. You talked about um that that pinging noise of tubeless seating. You mm-hmm. know, and these are tubeless tubeless wheel sets or I should say they're um you can you know they're only cleared for tubeless tire types only. You can still run a tube, but um, oh, you, you can. really okay. you can, but um, only with tubeless tire types. And really, if you run a tube, you're you're really not going to get the full benefits of the wheel. Um, but one of the things that's actually not not talked about a lot, so this is kind of insider info, is you know we put a lot of effort into um, getting the dimensions uh, um, dialed in. Um, to optimize uh, tubeless seating, so to really improve that process. So I think one of the gripes we hear from from customers, and we're aware of it, is that tubeless can be difficult to use, right? It can be sometimes mm-hmm. difficult to set up. And both these wheel sets, we, we've we made improvements on that. Um, and we did that by by changing the geometry and and then the, the the sizing of the diameters in the tire bed to, to really help the user um, uh, install tires. So I think, you know, that's going to be something that, that people notice. I mean, that's the first thing you do when you get your wheels is you put tires on. So, um, you know, I, I think I think I, I want to make sure people people know that that that's something that, that we've we've kind of worked hard on. But it doesn't really it doesn't really show up in all these performance numbers. But I, I think it's a, an important part of the experience. I think it is too, and I and I I am a big believer in in uh, riding tubeless. I've got tubeless on every bike that I own, which which is probably more than my wife wants it to be. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's I mean it is it is incredible, and yeah, sure, it takes a little bit of setup and a little bit of maintenance, um, checking to make sure that you still got sealant and you know going and, and it's fresh sealant and all that kind of stuff. But the, the experience that you have when you're you know carving through turns or you know up on a huge mountain climb and descending down, the confidence that you have of staying connected to the ground, and you can kind of hit more things and worry less about it. <laughs> it's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it simplifies it. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so a good plug for just going tubeless, um, right there, uh, free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk. Let's talk rolling resistance, uh, Mike, because this is always a hot topic in in cycling. Um, so can you tell us more about what rolling resistance actually is, what a contact patch is, and why that matters when it comes to performance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this is actually a great segue from from uh, tubeless, talking about tubeless, right? Yeah, it totally is. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, straight into rolling resistance. Well well done. So, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the I'm going to start off with the contact patch. We're talking about, sure. the, you know, when we say contact patch. So that's really, you know, that's just simply, it's the portion of the tire that is deformed to take up the force of, of the rider's weight, or the let's call it the system weight, the rider and the bike. So if you were able to, you know, ride over a piece of glass and walk underneath the glass and look up, you would see um, kind of an oblong shape that's contacting that piece of glass that's supporting the, the weight of the rider. So when we talk about contact patch, that's what we're talking about. And, Got it. And, and so, you know, that, that's all part of this kind of connects into this story. So the, the, as your tire rolls, if you think of uh, that contact patch, if you took a, a a silver Sharpie and you marked one position on your tire and were to track that as it went around, as the, the wheel rolled, um, each time that that portion of the tire contacted the ground, it would have to deform to, to create the contact patch. And then as it passed the ground, it would go back into you know, it's, it's, um, static shape. So 
when you think about rolling resistance, rolling resistance is actually the energy loss that's created by how much energy it takes to deform the tire as it con as it creates that contact patch versus how much is regained as it as it goes back to its static shape so that you know you you touched on kind of contact patch it it plays right into this rolling resistance story you know in the in the kind of scientific term for that is elastic hysteresis so that's that energy loss from the, the deformation of that contact patch. Gotcha. So like, how does that apply to me riding bikes fast and having fun? <laughs> Great, <laughs> yeah. Great question. So rolling resistance is, as part of kind of the TSC story. It's, it's just yet another thing trying to slow you down. Right. So really we want to do, do what we can to reduce rolling resistance, which I, I think is probably pretty obvious. Right. So totally. if we if we try to break it down and, and think about how you can reduce rolling resistance, well, that, that contact patch, it's really just driven um, by the, the force, so the weight of the, the rider in the system, and um, the, the pressure in the tire, right, to create an area. So as you pump up your tire more, there's more mm -hmm. pressure, there's going to be a smaller contact patch. So, um, you know, we talked about, um, or I think, you know, that's where a lot of riders historically have got, oh, I got to pump my tire up to 120 PSI. Right. I, you know, what they're trying to do scientifically is reduce their contact patch. And then that reduces the amount of deformation in their tire or this amount of sag that their tire has to has to go through as it as it rolls past the ground, mm -hmm. and then that would reduce their rolling resistance. Got it. You know, so yeah, why don't I just pump it up to one twenty and go for it? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's it's not. Yeah, that's not the whole story. It's not that simple. That would be great, <laughs> right. right? That would be great. But <laughs> simple. I, it would be simple. But <laughs> sure, sure. But I, I I mean, let's go back to that um, situation where you were. Uh, out and you took the fire road on 23s i imagine you probably yeah. had a hundred and something psi in there and yep. it was it was pretty uncomfortable and and I, I would guess probably pretty slow pretty pretty bumpy yeah yeah real nervous real bumpy real <laughs> choppy hoping i was going to get to the other side and not break a rim sure stuff like that <laughs> sure and 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 furthermore i'm guessing it's it it also you know as as you don't ride that setup now but if you can think back to when when the days when you did, it was also quite bumpy on on uh, on less dramatic roads than that fire road, right? It doesn't take much surface um, deformities to really shake you about. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because there's some, you know, that gets into the vibrational losses. But really, that's that's you know that's the reason why you don't you don't pump up your tire like that. Um, but I, I think, you know, I want to connect back because the other way you could, you know, reduce that rolling resistance is by going for a wider tire. So, you know, the rolling resistance is that reduction in, in energy loss. So if you can reduce the amount the tire sags or the amount it has to deform, you can reduce the rolling resistance. And a wider tire creates a um, a, a shorter contact patch has less tire sag and then can reduce rolling resistance at a like for like pressure. So for example, if you took a, a 23 millimeter tire and a 28 millimeter tire, pumped them both up to 80 PSI, the 28 millimeter tire would have less tire sag and less rolling resistance. So there's kind of two ways you can reduce rolling resistance. You can increase pressure or you can increase the width of the tire. Yep. That makes that makes a lot of sense and is that's really well described. Really yeah. well described. Th thank so, you. And yeah. and I and I hinted at it and and hopefully we get to it, but we can talk about in depth why why you can't just get by with that 120 psi because I'm sure yeah. a lot of people would that that is simple, right? <laughs> it is simple, but yeah, let's let's go right into it. So vibrational losses. So the the teeth chattering at 120 psi, 
uh, why why not why not do that? It's it's fast, Mike. What but what what are was what are what are the guys and, and gals missing that are riding at 120 psi still? Yeah, well, that's that's what you know. Um, I I don't want to offend anyone, but that's that's what your grandparents would say is to hop on and pump up to 120 psi and go down the road. But <laughs> but you know, quite frankly, that that bouncing we're talking about. Um, and that teeth chattering, that's all lost energy. So, you know, the human body is really just a big spring damper. Um, and so as, true. as it gets true. bounced around, right, all there's, there's movement in between the, the muscle fibers, um, the tissue, your organs, and it's, it's creating friction. And then that, that, you know, that fris- friction and, and viscous tearing that's happening is just, you know, it's creating, um, uh, kinematic energy so it's it's creating heat and it's it's, it's lost it's lost energy right. you know a, a colleague of mine described it as you know when when we get cold humans shiver naturally and mm-hmm. we shiver to heat up and expend energy so why why would you want to be rolling along when we're trying to conserve energy go as fast and as far as we can you wouldn't roll along shivering right <laughs> So it's ideally it's, no, but I've done it. I've done that yeah. too, and I did not like it. I did not like it. <laughs> so it, it's you know, in essence, it's kind of the it's the same concept. We're trying to reduce that movement in in the human, which is is lost energy into the system. So you know, the the way to do that is is to have energy absorbed somewhere, and in um, you know non suspension. Uh, road and gravel bikes that's either absorbed by by the frame or primarily by the tires if it's not absorbed by by you the rider so if it's going to be absorbed by the tires bigger tires at a lower pressure absorb the most energy i think probably for most of us that's 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 pretty obvious when when you go out and you rent that beach cruiser on vacation and it's got big old 40 seat tires at low pressure it's pretty comfortable Real comfortable. Love those yeah, bikes. It's vacation exactly. time. Vacation yeah. time. And it's smooth and you're not being bounced around and you you hit everything on the road and bounce up curbs and, <laughs> and it's all right. So it's But you're you're not gonna get the KOM though, Mike. On well those that well that it, not on the beach cruiser. No. <laughs> if you do, that's kudos. That's big in, kudos. That's pretty that's impressive. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> but but you but you're absolutely right. There there's um there's a uh, an optimum. This is, you know, actually, this is where TSE, the total system, this is where it comes into play. So, you know, in our testing, you know, we kind of discovered really, it, and as we joke about it, at the bigger tire you go and the lowest pressure you can get away with are the absolute best for reducing vibrational losses. And there's actually really no minimum. We, we had... Um, you know, we tested all the way down to, to, I would call it kind of ridiculous, 20, 30 PSI on road tire range. And we saw a reduction in um, required power from that rider all the way down on, on, a, on a, a, a bumpy road. Let's call it our, our bumpy road that we test on. So in terms of vibration, you go as big and as low as you can. But we know for rolling resistance, you... You actually want higher pressure to to um, balance your your contact patch, right? To reduce your rolling resistance. So mm-hmm. this is where the magic comes in of of the the total system efficiency. So you really want to balance large tires, low pressure, with larger tires but higher pressure to reduce rolling resistance. So the the you know the the two graphs of that are they they cross and create kind of a bit of a, a a bucket or a nice target and and that's that's where we've kind of um you know i i think to pat the the whole team on the back they've kind of figured that out and figured out you know versus our traditional setups that optimum for where that bucket is is much lower than it's been before because vibrational losses are such a a big component to the to the total system power required. Got it. So to bring this to bring this 
down to home a little bit more. I mean, we're joking about 120 and stuff, and we mean no offense. But you also mentioned, you know, we you brought them down to 30, you know, in testing. But for the new 303s with a tubeless setup and a 28 tire, what kind of pressure are we talking about for like, say, I don't know, average rider of 150 to 180 pounds? What kind of pressure are you running for that optimal performance in that situation? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great example. So so let's let's just pick right in the middle of that range. So somebody who's about one one sixty five, sure. they're going to be running in the rear with that twenty eight millimeter tire, which which on the three hundred three will really measure to about thirty millimeters, um, mm. because of that bigger internal width that we've designed in. You're going to want to run, um, or we I should say we recommend running about sixty psi in the rear and about 56 PSI in the front. So, you know, we were joking about 120, but that that's that's half of that, right? So it's half of that, it, yeah. It, and and it, even most guys who are running, you know, let's 80, 90 before, that's still 20 PSI less than that. I, I would think even my colleagues are, are um, let's say, you know, the colleagues who, who were riding before they, you know, we made these discoveries that they were in that range. So we've, we've kind of learned a lot on this product and, and where to target those pressures. So it is, and this is just shooting from the hip here. Um, it's, it's very counter cultural to run, you know, these lower pressures at zip. Have you, I mean, what's been the discussion about how to change riders habits? Like, how do you, how do you do that? Like across not only in the United States, but like truly across the world, people riding these bikes. Well, yeah, that's a great question because it's not, you know, we know it's not easy. Um, I, I think, you know, this conversation is a great start, right? Explaining, explaining oh, the, the, the product development and the story um, and some of these, this, this new knowledge that, you know, we've kind of uncovered. I, I think all of that's pretty important in in trying to make sure that people understand the the you know the science behind um, you know what we're talking about. Um, I, I think that's all that's all part of it. And um, you know, talking about tire pressure in general, I think is important. So, you know, I'm I'm I've been talking specifically about the, you know, that pressure recommendation of 60 PSI in the rear for a 165 pound rider, you know, that that's for the, uh, this, you know, this specific product, which has a, um, you know, a 25 millimeter internal width and, um, you know, it's a, it's a hookless rim. That's, you know, I, I think that's the latest and greatest, but a lot of, you know, the, I, I'm sure, or I, I let's say I hope most of your listeners are going out and buying this rim, but realistically I know that's not true. So for the guys who don't have, you know, a 25 millimeter internal rim, they still need to be thinking about their tire pressure, and just getting that conversation going is the gateway to to you know absorbing um, you, you know into the culture this this notion of of lowering the tire pressure in general. I, I agree with that. And, and to that end, I would then ask, why are we running 60 in the rear and 56 up front? What's the logic behind that? Behind the, the Delta? Um, yeah, basically the, the the difference, why why would you need to run less up front than in the rear? Uh, that, for, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted yeah, you. Yeah, because for, for some, the reason why I ask that is, um, when I go around doing training camps, especially on the mountain bike, I have a, a kind of a background in both mountain and road. And I remember, you know, five ish, five, seven years ago is kind of when I, we'd be running mountain bike camps and people would still turn up uh, with tubed mountain bike <laughs> tires. And it's like, okay, well, let's get some education around what tubeless could look like and the reasons for it. And then we drop tire pressure. And then we start talking about the differences between why tire pressure needs to be a little bit more in the rear versus um, the, the front for uh, traction and connecting with the ground. And it's the same now on road bikes as we're having this this very similar discussion, right? Because our weight is further back. You're putting essentially more weight um, to in in w- could experience more tire sag in the rear if you didn't have more internal pressure, right? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So really it's, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, for us, you know, on the road bike, um, you don't have as much of that um, looking for additional traction in the front uh, it, to the extreme that you do in the mountain bike, um, right, you know, right, right. On, on the mountain bike. Um, but really it's, it's a weight balance, right? Trying to, trying to get the tire sag to be even between the front and rear. Um, I, I think, you know, when we started looking into to tire pressures, I mean, seriously doing our research, we noticed that um, actually what a lot of people were recommending is a gap between front and rear was, was even bigger than just this four PSI that I'm talking about. Um, and in fact, it, some people were recommending 10 to 15, and we thought that was, that was we thought it was pretty dramatic, um, because really the, you know, on, on most road bikes, um, especially performance road bikes, you're, you're quite forward in your position and your weight is, is more central, I think, um, between front and rear tires, um, you know, and, and on the TT, if you, if you're on a, a time trial bike you know, you might even close that gap and, and even it up between front and rear. Um, right. So really, really, it's all about weight distribution. Yeah, and, and that's it. And I, and I think, you know, I, I sit here and I observe us talking on microphones from afar about, uh, you know, four to six <laughs> PSI differences. But I think, and so we can laugh about, I'm, I'm glad to be doing it, but we can laugh about it. But when it actually, when it applies to performance, and you start to change your habits and you get these new wheel sets and you spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars on it, you're, you better get educated on how to use it best because not only if it's for performance and you're going for a state, you know, uh, championship or uh, world championship, or if you're just looking to crush some people at the group ride, it, it's important to know how it works. Right? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because otherwise, otherwise you just, you're, you just wasted your money basically. <laughs> Well, yeah, that that's right. I, I, you know, these these wheel sets. You know, if if you go out and and every single time, if I, if I personally, if I were to get on the new three three Firecrest and pump it up to its maximum um, allowable pressure, which is five bar or, or seventy two and a half psi, it, the ride feel and the the speed and the grip, it it would not be that that's not optimum, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, yes, you know, we made a, a more optimized um, rim shape for that, for, you know, for a 28 millimeter tire specifically. So yeah, it's going to be a, a, an arrow wheel, but in terms of, of the reduction in, in, in vibration losses and, you know, a target rolling resistance um, and then increase cornering grip, you know, th those sort of benefits, you're not going to experience them. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's in, tire pressure is really, it, it is important to the overall experience and, um, you know, not just for new rims though. I, I think that's important is that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I, I, I kind of have a, uh, I don't know if it's a bad reputation or let's just call it a reputation for kind of being a, a little bit preachy about tire pressure around the office. So really challenging guys, asking them every time they go out, hey, what tire pressure are you running today? Hey, mm -hmm. why, why aren't you a few PSI lower? Hey, did you pay attention to your front rear difference? Because at the end of the day, your tires are the only thing touching the tarmac. Yeah. It's the only Hopefully. thing. Hopefully. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. 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 Let's hope so. Yeah. So... <laughs> So you should care for, you should, you should care about them, you know, as much as you care about everything else. And, and, and the thing you can control is, is tire pressure. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess that is a little bit preachy or, or let's, you know, or, or speaking from a, from a, a pulpit about it, but yeah, I, I, it's really important and it's important for everybody, right. To yeah. try to dial in experience, you know, experiment with your tire pressure and, and I, it's going to create a better ride experience. Yes, yes. And as a as an engineer, I would I would you know wish for nothing more and hope for nothing more out of that life. Um, <laughs> and and I will uh, get a little maybe preachy here, but also think about okay, we're you know we're talking about performance here, and and, and you and I, many of the listeners are not going for the world championship. 
right? But they are they are going to go experience, you know, a Grand Fondo in a different part of the of the world or the nation or in their state. And as we do camps and we do these charity rides and things, and I go around and work with individuals who maybe don't spend more than 10 hours or eight hours on a bike, you know, per week. And the descending is very scary. And I look at, you know, I look at wheels and tires that can like instantly improve rider experience going downhill and cornering at whatever speed you're comfortable with, but it like it automatically improves that experience. And to me, that's like, whew, that's awesome. Cause more people are going to get on bikes. More people are going to want to go do that Fondo or going to want to go get fit because they don't feel all sketched out on the 23s, you know? No, a- absolutely. So, you know, I, I think you touched on a really good, a really important point, right? Is, is I talked about that motto we have, you know, the making you faster, uh, you know, that's making you faster everywhere not just on the streets, that's also in the corners. And, mm-hmm. and it, you know, I, I know very few people will have experienced these wheel sets yet, but I can tell you from a lot of the, you know, I, I test ride uh, um, um, the wheels as, as, as luckily part of my job, right? And that was one of the very first things I noticed with going to these wider tire beds and bigger tires is the amount of grip that, that I had, you know, I'm, I, I don't race crits, but I ride with guys who race crits. And if you want to keep up in, you know, on our routes, you better be ready to, to at least do your best to carve the corners or else you're really going to be gassed at the end of the ride. I, I mean, you know, yeah. just to hang on. And, you know, when I switched to, you know, I made the full evolution from my beginning, you know, kind of, um, in working at zip from, uh, skinny tube setup, um, moving to tubeless, increasing my tire size, changing to the, the wider internal width, and then finally, you know, reducing my, my tire pressure. And every single one of those steps helped me increase my confidence on the bike along the way and made me faster. So, you know, I think the, a user, um, you know, or, or one of your listeners just, just going out to a bike shop and, and if they're able and, and trying a new wheel set or, or even hopping on somebody's who, who has a, a newer wheel set or is experimenting or experimenting with wider tires and just taking a quick lap. I think they're, they're going to have their, you know, I think their mentality will change pretty quickly or, or at least they'll be pretty jealous and, and, and want to go out and, and spend some money on a new wheel set. I I know that that's my sentiment is, is I, I really found I'm, I'm more confident on the bike in in corners and, um, and, and you're right. It, it absolutely changes the way you feel about riding. Yeah. Yeah. It's a quote, our, our good friend, friend, uh, Jason Blodgett, also a, a coworker of yours. I remember, I think it was like January. He was on, I, I think 303S or something. And, and I was texting with him back and forth. He's like, Adam, it feels like I'm cheating going in and out of the corners. It's incredible. <laughs> like, All, right. All right. We got to talk about this. So, um, but yeah, to- totally. So it, it, you know, we're at a cool time in history where, you know, we're doing some very unique stuff with, um, with bike technology, tire technology, and it's, it's really fun to, to talk about. Um, now there was, oh man, we, we could talk at length here, Mike, and I, we're all, <laughs> already getting long, but, um, what I want to do is, is talk about that, a little product here just for a minute, cause it does stand out the lifetime warranty that, that zip talks about is, is that, true is that i mean you you hear a lot about lifetime warranties so how does this thing work and how does it apply to our listeners who are actually thinking about maybe even getting something like this yeah so um you know that this is this is new for us new for zip um it first debuted under the the three zero moto product but now we've we've rolled it into the road you know new road rims but basically the this lifetime warranty for for the you know the 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 initial purchaser of the wheel set, it covers any damage that occurs to the, the, the wheels while riding the bicycle under its intended use. 
So, for example, um, you know, you were out riding, you hit the mother of all potholes on the group ride because the idiot in front of you didn't point it out. You happen to have 10 PSI in your tire and, uh, you know, somehow your rim cracks. We'll replace it because you were out intended use. That happens, right? Um, that being said, you know, we talked a lot about MTV. If you, uh, you know, somehow fit your brand new 303 FC to your downhill rig and don't quite land a 10 foot gap, <laughs> that one's on you, right? <laughs> we know the 303 FC, it's the Firecrest, it's, it's not a downhill wheel outside of intended use. Lastly, though, you know, we, you know, I know this, you know, it's a bit producty, but it's, it's also meant to be a gravel wheel. And we've done a lot of testing out in gravel, and we know that guys are starting to, to go on single track, really ride some, some pretty, um, I, I'd call it intense stuff for, for a gravel bike. And um, if anything happens out while you're riding gravel, it, it's covered because that's part of the intended use envelope. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's pretty special. You know, when they first came to me way back in development about it, I, I have to admit, as an engineer, you're nervous. Um, but mm -hmm. we increased our level of testing, um, both in the lab and in the field. And, you know, we're, we're confident we can get away with this, uh, get away with the warranty. Uh, because, you know, of the listeners out there who are, who are thinking through all the things they've hit, you know, in our testing, we hit all of them <laughs> and the wheel survived. Yeah. So we're, we're, you know, we're confident and, and if something happens, it'll be covered. So, you know, I, I know that's a bit lengthy, but it, it's kind of special. So I'm, I'm excited that, that they pushed us to, you know, develop a product that, that can, uh, can be able to offer that sort of warranty because we know they're expensive, so they should be covered. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, uh, I mean, stand behind your product like that. And that's a strong message right there. So, um, again, a little producty, but it, it, that, that stood out to me, which is why I wanted to bring it up. Cause I was like, man, yeah. they're, if they're touting that, that's, that's worth talking about. So, um, well, excellent. It, Mike, this is, this has been awesome. We've, we've covered a ton today and we're, we're going over. We've, sure. there's more stuff that I, that I did want to cover, but I think it's, the time that we start wrapping up and it's, it's really good to see companies evolving with the rider, you know, with what the rider wants, meaning, you know, I want to, I want to ride gravel. I want to ride road and I want to be able to not shatter my bike in doing so. And, you know, we're really talking about the versatility of what a bike and, and a wheel set can do, uh, but not sacrifice the performance. And so I think zip has really, um, you know, hit the bullseye on that with, with this. And it's really fun to talk about. Um, so to kind of summarize, I, I like to finish with some of these takeaway questions and some of these questions we actually like already <laughs> nested into here. So I'm actually going to start with my third question, Mike, and then I'm going to like throw in just a random one toward the end. It really set you, set you off kilter. Sure. Sure. <laughs> All right. So First question to you, uh, what is a common misconception when buying a new wheel set, when a customer is buying a wheel set or shopping for it? What's a common misconception out there? Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, one thing I think I can, I can speak of or that, I, that I've, you know, kind of heard at the water stops or the coffee stops is, um, you know, you can't ride your zip wheel set all the time or your carbon wheel set for that matter. But, you know, here we're talking about zip wheels mm -hmm. um, and they're only, you know, you're only meant to get them out on, on race day or special occasions. And we, we just talked about a new warranty and, um, and, and, and if that doesn't convince you, it, you know, I don't know what will to, to ride your wheels all the time, ride them daily. So, you know, you should feel confident in, in what you're buying and using. And I think that, that to me is, that's a, a misconception that you, you know, you can't, you can't be riding your carbon wheels all the time. We've made a ton of advancements in making the wheel sets more durable. Um, and then again, you know, we're, we're standing by that and we're covering them. So yeah, I, I think ride your wheels. <laughs> 
Yeah, right. that's that's actually that's spot on. That's that's also what I hear a lot. I don't do. I'm always like, man, I'm gonna ride these awesome <laughs> wheels all the time. Yeah, and yeah. but it's, it's still a common um, a common concept out there is training wheels and racing wheels. Yeah, yeah. What let's you know if people want to buy two sets of of zip wheels to train and race on the more the merrier for me, right? True. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. (laughs) But I'm telling them, you know, if they just buy one set, they should, they should use their set. So. Cool. Okay. (laughs) So if a, so second question for you is if a listener just bought a brand new bike like this year and they're listening to this podcast and they're like, Oh, great. Now I need to get a a new wheel set because the one I just got is not as wide should they go out there and, and buy these new 303s or should they be should they be patient uh well that i mean that's a tough question right you're asking uh somebody whose paycheck comes from uh people buying wheels <laughs> so <laughs> right i mean so but uh, you'd like the best person to ask because i'm like okay well <laughs> yeah <you> <laughs> so i mean the the, the frank answer is uh, i mean with with these this 303 family of wheel sets, we know that they're they're faster and more capable than than ever before, and what's out there. So, it, if you know, I I, I think I, I would absolutely recommend somebody to go out and, and look at look at a new you know one of these wheel sets. It, you know, if if you got a bike that's that you know a lot of these new um, road frames they're not called all road frames but you know the what used to just be the 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 light bike or the the endurance road bike now it's got these um, potential to run maybe up to 32 35 millimeter tires you know if you want to take advantage of that and and still um, you know get the the full um, aerodynamic benefits and the and the and and still be quick you know you're going to want a rim that matches that and that's what the 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 303s do um you know i'm i'm not saying that whatever wheel sets are out there are bad but you know this this you know our strategy of of looking at the whole system um i think it is is pretty special and it's it's really allowed um, riders to to make a benefit of of using wider tires, um, which which comes with all those those uh, uh, great things like increased speed and comfort and, and you know cornering grip, etc. So yeah, I'd I'd recommend it, but um, it, yeah, that's all I can say. I I love them. I I'd certainly yeah. buy myself a set. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, and I will apologize because it's kind of, a, it's, it's like a put you in a bad spot, but the, like what I want the listener to, th- to think about is it, it is a complete system. And oftentimes my athletes will ask me, you know, which bike to buy and, and how to buy it and all this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> oftentimes they'll, they'll buy a complete bike in the, 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 say the frame is, you know, pretty darn good. The group set's pretty darn good and, and they're saving some money and, and the wheel set may not be as good. And so one very quick, very good way of upgrading, you know, a bike system or a bike setup is indeed in the wheels. And so, it, you know, again, depending on like how much you spent and what are the actual wheels and all that kind of stuff, if you bought like medium, a wheel set will definitely upgrade the complete bike setup in a very quick way. And that's, that was kind of my, my way of jamming that question in there yeah, <laughs> to get people I, thinking differently. So, well, I, uh, that's actually a great way to think about it. Right. Is, is, you know, out of all the things you can upgrade, you know, per dollar, I think wheels really, really pay off. Right. Uh, we do, said it before, yeah. but you know, hopefully every ride, the rubber is the only thing touching the ground and, and you want that system that that's, you know, touching the rubber, you, you want that to be complete. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's what we've strived to do. So yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Okay. So final question, Mike, and this is the curveball. This is the curveball. All right. So you're doing Grand Fondo. You got a giant hill climb. You get to the top 
and all of a sudden it is chip seal and gnarly on the downhill. But you know you've got a hill climb finish to go. That's all pavement and super glassy pavement. Are you going to dump pressure at the top of the first hill climb, or are you going to keep it in? Whoa, what a what an interesting scenario. <laughs> uh, let's see. It, it, you know, if if you're trying to win this Grand Fondo, I don't know how you could be stopping to, to let out pressure. <laughs> well, try, there's an aid station up there. I'm there's an aid to, station. I'm trying to get, my way, get my way out of answering. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think ideally we talked about this kind of this like, um, uh, you know, ideal bucket of when when vibration losses take over from rolling resistance. Um, if in this scenario and I'm running um, 303s and I see that chip and seal, I think I would let out a little bit of pressure because I mm-hmm. know um, you know the wider tire bed, and I know personally from experience that um, you know these rims they're not going to feel squirmy. That's that's one of the special things about them. As you go lower and lower in pressure, that feeling of you know I think kind of really came from tube setups at too low pressure where they, you know, they get that squirm feel. Um, you know, that's something really special about these is that, that just, that doesn't happen until really dramatically low, low pressures, you know, outside of rideable pressures, I should say. So, you know, if it were me, yeah, I think I, I'd, I'd press the Presta a little bit and, and, and let out a few PSI, um, knowing with confidence that, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think I would get, um, you know, I, I don't think I'd have any losses on that paved uphill at the end. So yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting, uh, question though. Kudos for coming up with that. That's, you have quite the imagination. <laughs> well, that's, that's just it. And, in in and really that's what we're talking about. It's the sweet spot between the vibrational losses and the rolling resistance. And from everything I've seen from you guys is, you can really maximize, you know, the, the vibrational losses and, and not really give away on the rolling resistance to optimize that performance. And so I would do the same thing at the very top in that scenario for sure. So. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would like to think hopefully, uh, in that situation, I'd done, I'd, you know, I've done enough testing on my own of tire pressures that I'd, I'd already be spot on, but Sure. <laughs> Maybe of that's just the uh, engineer nerd in me. But... <laughs> that's right. But uh, oh. yeah, if anything, experiment with your tire pressures. And yeah. anyone, every rim, every you know, every setup, experiment. It's important. It's really important. That's a big. That's my number one takeaway. I couldn't agree more. And so, if if you got through this podcast, you listen to us just completely go off on tangents. If you just take away anything, it's start experimenting with tire pressure because I think it will open up a lot of people's minds. So, Mike, this is this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking <laughs> t- taking a lot of time out of your work day uh, to chat with me. Uh, but if if um, if listeners want to follow you or they want to check out Zip, like how do they do that? Yeah, I think you know. Um... The, the zip speed Instagram, I think is a, is, you know, is, is obviously a great, um, a great place to, to follow, um, you know, not only our developments and some product stories, but a lot of the athletes, um, that, that, you know, we, um, we sponsor that ride our stuff. So for me, that's, that's a go-to that's just, uh, at zip speed, um, So that would be a great place. And then um, with this new um, you know, family of products or the product launch uh, of the model year uh, 21 wheels, we've, uh, we've upgraded our website or, or actually I should say completely overhauled our website. So there's a brand new zip.com and um, there's a, you know, a lot of fun tools on here to, to play around with. So uh, there's some more information on the total system efficiency. Um, we have a brand new wheel finder, which kind of uh, takes you through uh, some inputs about your ride style and, and maybe recommends a couple wheel sets you, you'd be interested in. And then, of course, um, a whole bunch of product information, um, 
and and you know where you could where you can buy products. So I, I think yeah, check out those spots. It's 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 good browsing in between uh, the rest of your workday. <laughs> That's right. That is absolutely true. Well, cool. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate your time and looking forward to testing some of these wheels soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me.